welcome to Freedom. This is today's edition of the Citizens Church on Civic Space TV. I am Philip Melissa. Today, the chat is breaking down the road to the 2026 general elections in Uganda, and we are paying special attention to the challenges and opportunities that are ahead of us in order to get a peaceful transition of power. Now, joining me in that conversation is a panel of distinguished citizens, usual citizens of this country whom I will introduce starting from my extreme left from Uganda People's Congress, the Honorable Ocheno Joseph. Honorable, you're most welcome. Welcome back from the ED break. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Next to Honorable Ocheno is from the Center for Constitutional Governance, Dr. Birete Sara. Doctor, you're most welcome and welcome back from ED. Thank you and the good afternoon viewers and listeners. And lastly is Dr. Ojambo Robert from Chambogo University. Doctor, you're most welcome and welcome from ED, Steve. Yeah, thank you, ED. I didn't go anywhere. I was just around here. Yeah, <laughs> we do not have uh, a Muslim on the panel, so certainly it is not something we shall talk about. Now, I want to begin with you, Dr. Sarah. We have a background in this country of uh, very many elections, but I want us to talk about two specifically, the 2020, 2016 general election and the 2021 general election. One of the things that are so common in the two was violence, allegedly rigging, buy-offs, things that don't sound good in a democratic system. When you look at the preparations we have today in the country, 2024, when we have a year to the next election, what picture do you get from where you sit? Thank you, Phil. Before I come to your specific question, as we well have a background to the topic, you know, when assessing a landscape, a political landscape of a country, there are parameters that you evaluate. Among them is the political actors or institutions, and this includes the political parties, where one of us belongs. What's the state or health of the political parties in this country? You also look at the political context or the civic space, like, like the name of the TV we are on. The latest World Freedom Report ranks political freedoms in this country at 11 out of 40. That's by Freedom House, which is a a US-based organization, but represented in every country almost globally. So the latest ranking puts Uganda overall at 35%, and Uganda is ranked as not free. We are in red. In terms of political freedoms, we scored 11 out of 40, and a range of issues are assessed, including freedom to mobilize, freedom to fundraise, freedom to recruit membership, freedom to market to the political party programs, among others. On the civil liberties that also come in following into the health of the citizens to participate in governance, Uganda scored 26 out of 60, meaning that uh, in here you are looking at the health of, of NGOs or civic organizing, you're looking at the knowledge levels and competence of citizens to take informed decisions. You're looking at freedom of citizens to access information and be imparted by those marketing their programs. You're looking at the welfare of citizens, because when it comes to politics, the economic levels of citizens also matter. How firm are they, are these people who can? Because when you look at the political rights, People who are struggling to find a meal for a day have no luxury in engaging in politics because they are, they, they are still struggling with livelihood issues. Somebody who is not sure of where to sleep or whether a landlord will have put a padlock on their houses or whether he can buy a kilo of kosher for his family or whether children can go to school has no luxury to engage in the debates that we are engaging in. 
And these are the majority Ugandans that we are talking about. 60% of Ugandan population today has no luxury to engage in politics because they are struggling with feeding, with accommodation, with health, with clothing. Clothing is a struggle. That's why you see that people in the countryside fight for T-shirts, very poor quality T-shirts that politicians throw at them. For them, it is a, another Christmas wear. For some, it's the only opportunity they can wear a new cloth because they always afford the least class of second hand. This is the only new cloth in their wardrobe. Mm. So these are the kind of seasonry that we are talking about and how they engage in governance. The third parameter that you look at is the institutions or the state of rule of law because that covers the concept of equality before the law, elements of presumption of innocence until proven guilty, but also the protection of fundamental rights and freedoms that now enable citizens overall to freely participate in their governance. The last element that we, I will talk about is then where your question is, the electoral processes. Do we have trust? Is there an element of trust in the electoral processes? Is there professionalism and fairness in our electoral processes? As we talk today, the, new, the newly appointed electoral commissioners, 80% of them are, have known partisan belonging. 80% known partisan belonging as cadres of the regime. If you are known as a cadre of the regime, where is your royalty? Is your royalty to Uganda or to the regime? Is your royalty to citizens of Uganda or to the appointing authority? And how impartial are you therefore going to be in the execution of your mandate? So this is the state, this is the landscape that we are talking about in, in, in ahead of 2026. When it comes to now your specific question, the baseline of 2026 elect 2016 elections and 2021 elections. Since the enactment of the constitution, we've had five election, electoral cycles. Every other new election is worse than the previous. That has been the trend, a deteriorating trend, steady deterioration. So the 1996 election was better than 2021, 201. 201 is better than 206. True. 206 is better than 2011. 2011 is better than 2016. 2016 is better than 2021. So using that as a baseline, <coughs> what should citizens expect? Mm -hmm. wow. The worst, and that I wish to stop at that. Thank you, Doctor, indeed. The trend you give of how better it is to be in the past than in the present is actually worrisome. But I want to come to you, Dr. Ujambo. When you listen to what Dr. Sarah puts out, and she's in the civil society, she interacts with these on a daily basis. Reading from the activity of the people in power in this country, the National Resistance Movement and its leadership, do we sense something that improves what doctor just described? 2021, 2016 is better than 21. 11 is better than 16. Can 2026 be better than 2021? Mm, I don't think so. And there is no direction to take you there. I normally relate this to athletics. Uh, it's one of the most fair games that you will find on earth, athletics. You win because you are good. Uh, and that's why some of us still believe that the, the greatest of all times in Ugandan athletics is still John Akibwa. Because that man went and surprised the world. Nobody knew that a black man 
and moreover from Africa, not even black people, but black men from Africa, would go and win. And the gun went, and the man ran, and everybody saw that he was the first in uh, ahead, and they would not stop him. So in athletics, once you have a, a poor or what they call a wrong start, they repeat. They repeat mm -hmm. the race if one of you wanted to cheat. And that's why in athletics, it's very, it's very, very dangerous to try to break the rules. You will be disqualified there and then, mm -hmm. which you, there are not second chances. So if you go for Olympics, I remember there was one runner from Ocheno's place called Ogola. He went to try sprints. <laughs> And because of our poor training, the man could not begin. The first time they gave him a, a yellow card, the second time it was a red card. And he never participated. He has been training for a whole year. In mm. fact, for a whole four years. Because normally the cycle is four mm. years. And that is it. You just take it for that. They say that for a country to send somebody here to run 100 meters must have run 11.4. This, more than that, you will not come. That's why most African countries don't have representatives. In fact, Uganda, I think for the last 20 years, has not had a, a sprinter and a 100 meter in the Olympics. Not because Uganda should, but the rules are strict because they want the best. Now, going back to what she said, indeed she has been watching, I think 1996, she was an adult, she has been watching and participating. And she gives a very fair, a very fair, analysis of the elections in Uganda. But the question you should ask, are these elections organized so that they are fair? Mm. Because everything mm. normally follows the objective. What is the objective of elections? From the beginning, you would really see like many African countries that uh, election was not the thing. Because the president came here in 1986. How come elections were only in 1996? And the lie was that they were writing a constitution, they wanted to organize the country. How come the others were being carried on, the NRC and what have you, elections were on, and RC? How come the one of the president is where there was problems? In my view, and I've said this several, I even write, that President Museveni has never wanted to compete in an election with anyone. And he does it deliberately. And people who believe like him also have that mentality. And once you go in an election, when you don't believe in it, it can never be fair. So in most cases, the elections which are organized in Uganda are just to create some legitimacy. But they are organized that the president wins. But there must be some competition of some sort. I remember commenting on the BBC one time, when they organized the referendum to let the parties come in. And I was saying it was a bogus thing. And they were just supposed to sit in parliament and say that from today onwards, we have allowed the, the parties to participate. Because you remember, the opposition even shunned that referendum. And they went and created a man called Ochegere. I don't know where he went. <coughs> Who Ochegere was a part of them. So. Uh, the NRM was competing with itself. <laughs> and poor man Ochegere was de de declared that had been defeated because Ochegere did not want parties. Did not want parties for him to come back. But Mseven wanted legitimacy. That you see, the thing we had agreed in the constitution, that the system of government will be changed by referendum. And therefore you had to organize a referendum where there was nobody. And of course, that was the first, I mean, I saw that as one of the first problems in our thing. 1996 was not, it was for, was to confirm the prince. Uh, the person had been on, the heir had sat on the throne as a prince for so long. So they needed to confirm him as a, and that's why they had to measure. And once they saw that Obote would not be in that election, it was agreed because they know Semogere would not win. This other guy, there was no soldier. So 1996 was just to confirm the prince, and that's why the president got 76%. And if you check, even the percentage has been reducing. Uh, that <laughs> one, he got 76%. Uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, the, the first uh, multi-party election, that's when you would really see the wrath of these elections. Because at least at that time, there was a formidable... 
uh, a formidable competitor in the name of uh, Dr. Kiza Vesije. And you see the man almost lost his life. He was coming from prison, to, uh, from court, from prison, from court to campaign trail. So at the end of the day, the man gets 30, 30 something percent. Mm -hmm. And I thought, eh, that man had won. So in Africa, the first problem is that elections are not organized so that the best candidate wins. Elections are organized so that the incumbent gets legitimacy. Thank legitimacy. You. So Thank you. from such a thing, mm. you, you see that, for example, next election, 2026 Six. election, this is going to be a, a, a harder election. It's harder than all times. Because there are so many other things that have come up. For the first time, the NRM has two parties. By party, I don't mean political party, but groups. There are groups who believe that the NRM led by Yoerim Seven is tired. It cannot fight corruption. It cannot fix problems of the country, and therefore it is tired. It needs to be replaced. And that's why some people thought that when this pillar was coming out, it was a joke. It's not a joke. There are some people who may not know the intentions of Pilau, but we are supporting it, genuinely thinking that it can usher in change. And that's why you see there is division. The political parties, this time it has been NRM which is, has been causing violence against opposition. This time I see a situation where opposition is going to fight amongst themselves. Thank you so much, Doctor, for, for that. Yes. You know, Honorable Ocheno, you see, when you listen to Dr. Jambo here, talking about how the election is organized for the president to win it, the incumbent, mm -hmm. what signal does that send to the Uganda People's Congress? It's not a specific signal to UPC. It's a confirmation <laughs> of what we've been saying all along. And uh, my frustration, and I generally mean it as serious frustration, is that it took us 38 years for many Ugandans, and I'm challenging Ugandans, for many Ugandans to listen to us, and for many Ugandans to believe us. Uh, we told Ugandans, NRA is a thing. And we told Ugandans, NRA is a vehicle for Mr. Museveni. And we told Ugandans, Museveni is not a Democrat. We told you Uganda's Museveni is not interested in community politics. Um, Sarah made the fantastic introductory submission, and so marked by you know, the mathematical uh, 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 array by Dr. Jumbo. Rather impressive. In fact, this, uh, this athletics uh, you know, uh, uh, context is absolutely what democracy should be all about. And it's something that we, for me, as a campaigner for, 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 for human rights generally, but also Cooperative democracy over a period of time, you know, is uh, the standard that we want to be had in this country. It's unfortunate that it's unlikely to happen in the next election, or possibly, hopefully, the one after. If the one after is a post seven election, it's possible for us to to have such an arrangement because that is extremely important. As Sarah was referring to the index of uh, contextual background to these things, including freedoms. Mm -hmm. These are absolutely imperative prerequisites uh, for political processes and democracy to prevail. But what's also even much more important is that it is those requisites, requisites that a nation state requires in order to grow, in order to develop. And so we need these components in order for us to grow as a nation. Um, and our growth actually at the moment is to reunite, uh, to develop ourselves, to invest in ourselves, to invest in new young people of this country, to prepare yourselves to become competitive enough as citizens of this Africa, to prepare yourselves to become competitive citizens of this continent and citizens of the world, particularly in this day and age where only a few weeks ago I could not sit in this shot because it was too hot, you know, climate change, global warming, and nobody is talking this politics of crisis. In any case, actually, the politics between today and, and the, the, the elections is going to be politics about away from Pilau and what's going on internally in other political parties to an extent, Robert is right, is the politics of money. Where now we believe that some of the manipulations that are taking place, in, including in Parliament, is how NRA is working to suck up money, to go ahead and distribute to people in order to confuse them come 
it would be otherwise very difficult election in 2026 using people's own money. So we need to be able to tell Ugandans that those monies are actually their monies. In any case, I think that um, um, Museveni lost 1980 general elections. I want to say the fairest elections after 1962 was 1980 general elections, and we can be able to come back and discuss that. Because one of the reasons, uh, Robert, is that as it happens, Uganda, for the first time, we decided we defaced post 1979 to invite the Commonwealth Observer. So apparently it hadn't happened before anywhere to come and, in, 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 come, come and, and become observers. So, Honorable Cheno, what, yes. Mr. Museveni has never, at least to the best of my knowledge, never mm. said he won that election. He complains about the irregularities Which between the, the 1980 election. Yeah, so what's the point here? Yeah. You say Seven did not win that election. Yes, he didn't win. Okay, if that's what I said, I basically said he lost. He lost those elections. Mm -hmm. He lost those elections, and there are no grounds really for for for, for him to have laid the claim. In any case, um, if he claims he did not lose win it, then what, what took him to the bushes? What took him to torture and maim our people in Luweru? What took him to persuade little kids, poor little kids from Kazo, <laughs> little boys and girls, to go ahead and learn how to beat and how to kill and how to break and how to to disintegrate our country and how to hate other Ugandans simply because they don't share similar names or perhaps uh, our facial features. I'm saying that um, um, as early as 1980, the Ugandan leaders, predominantly UPC at the time, had the view that we needed, if we need to, a nation to grow in a democratic space, if we needed to have a government that respects human rights, if we needed to have a government in which you can talk about the four arms of government, the legislature, uh, the executive and uh, the, the judiciary and indeed yourselves as the fourth estate, you know, we needed to have some kind of reasonable benchmark and hence go, have an, go ahead and have an election which has got legitimacy. Your fourth estate to make sure that the citizens are consciously aware of this. I'm trying to talk about the benchmarking thing, meaning there was an attempt to have an element of fairness. And part of what the Dr. Jumbo team of academicians haven't yet done thus far is to critique what I'm saying. Because sometimes, sometimes when I talk about these things, people think it's boring. No, I'm doing so genuinely because I'm saying we need to go ahead and reinvestigate where we're coming from because it's extremely important that we reach a stage in which we're able to go and start where it's an athletic start, where it's open, it's fair, it's competitive, and where the best, the best wins. Thank you. Th thank you, Honorable. Dr. Biretti, if I come back to you, in all the submissions, there's one common thing or person we talk about, President Museveni, who's been here for 38 years. And uh, Dr. Jumbo here did say he doesn't see the system organizing anything better. In fact, he says it is going to be worse because of President Museveni, because the election is organized for him to win. Is President Museveni such a bad person for this country, Uganda, that he doesn't want to see any progress for it? No, I, I, I think to just simply amend your question is uh, to say, <laughs> is President Museveni such a bad Democrat? Because, because they, all citizens of Uganda, including him, have a right to, to enjoy their sovereign rights, which includes standing for office or voting others to, be, to vote or to be voted for. For, for, for a public office. I have been checking the history of freedom fighters or so-called revolutionaries in Africa to check whether a, a revolutionary or a gunman can transform into a democrat. And I will uh, not specifically look at just the gunmen. Let me look at all the leaders we consider revolutionary in Africa the freedom fighters. We can look at Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, who led the country for about 24 years. Mm. Two. Two. 22. 22 years, mm. and allowed Tanzania to transform. And he took a back seat to check whether his efforts had nurtured a nation that can peacefully transit power and continue on a progressive trajectory. And he saw that before he died. So he witnessed his success by creating a transformative nation. It, 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 it might not be perfect, 
but in terms of a democratic trajectory, in terms of national unity, in terms of a uniting language, Tanzania is among the, the only countries in Africa where every citizen can follow parliamentary proceedings, can follow court proceedings because of a uniting language and which is official. The courts administer justice in Kiswahili. Parliament debates in Kiswahili. Whether somebody has gone to school or not, they are informed in real time as these major national processes are taking place. Cabinet meets in Kiswahili. So they don't have the divide, the, the, the literacy divide that, that we struggle with in Uganda. When you look at Kenya, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta died in power because he's also among the founding, he's a founding father for Tanzania. He did not transit power. But there was a bit of a foundation because he had told the people that if I'm not here, my vice president becomes. becomes. People tried to fight Moi. That transition, there was a struggle. But it stood. The transition stood. The country did not erupt into chaos. And they transited. We can look at mm. uh, <coughs> Mandela, Mzei Mandela. And maybe I will pick one example in West Africa. Mzei Mandela led the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. 27 years in prison, subjected to hard labor. If he had chosen to follow his, I will call it human animal instinct, for lack of a better word, because we all have these instincts that are raw. So if he had chosen to follow his raw instinct, he would have been the most angry person after release. But he chose forgiveness. He put South Africa above everything else, including his hard feelings. Served for four years and led South Africa to move on. A few things were, were fixed, a few were not. Like having equitable education, the, the question of the economy, they, 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 they are still pending. Yes. Yeah, but he fixed the political question. He fixed the reconciliation question. And what does that show? That one man is not there to fix everything in a country. Other leaders should also lay their brick. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Jambo, mm. when you listen to those examples, President Mandela, President Nyerere, President Kenyatta, you can talk about many others, President Mugabe, President Kenneth Kaunda, there yeah, Mugabe failed to transit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very many they are. <laughs> the biggest percentage of them have failed to transit, like Dr. Bireta here says. But we look at Uganda, where we have opportunity. We have a president. We have elections. We have a system created, democratic. You talked about Italia, with all its challenges, 2005 referendum and so on. What specific component of this system is failing the transition in this country? Uh, I think the, the, the specific system is the, the engine of the system. I have said this uh, earlier. You see, the Africanness of democracy. Uh, we have, uh, this is not Africa in the character of an African, but what has become of the Africans. Africans don't believe in systems. Many of us don't believe in systems. And this uh, not believing in systems is created by the leaders. We believe in strong men. And that's why uh, in most cases, somebody does not tell you who did something. I mean, how something was done, but uh, they will emphasize who did something. This big man syndrome, where you have uh, a president, and the president 
they you hear people saying uh, in their language the fountain of honor uh, the, the, the head of state, the commander in chief, those, uh, those uh, praisings are the ones which are a major problem. Because instead of creating systems, they create patronage. And that patronage depends on clientelism, where people, the citizens now are just clients to be given small, small little things to eat, a position here, a position there and they think that that is the country they can have. For example, I've been seeing recently people congratulating. Uh, I have never seen a minister or a person being congratulated in the US or in UK uh, when somebody is made a secretary or something. You don't see a halabaloo <laughs> that we see here. People even have parties, they can organize prayer, thanksgiving, and there is a bishop who is going to put on with the, those clothes of theirs to thank God that somebody has eaten the, the position of a minister. <laughs> That's how they call it. They say it, eaten. So that is what kills the system. Uh, instead of creating a system where a minister, when they give you ministry, I'm supposed to call Ocheno and say, oh, trouble has come to me. I have been given a duty. Mm. How do you advise me to get out of this, uh, to, to, to make sure that I succeed? I will call him for party. Oh, did you know? We have eaten. I have a friend of mine, an old friend of mine called Isa Siviji. Uh, he's, a, he's a professor in the Faculty of Law of, of Dar es Salaam. And this old man normally describes these things better. He gives a, a, a description of how we got independence, and he says, when we got independence, the four fathers that she was mentioning ate the fruits of the tree of independence. When the predecessor, I mean the ones who succeeded them, ate the fruits and the leaves, the ones of today, the Msevenis, the Wat, and these current people, they have eaten the whole plant. <laughs> because they think they are very important people. That's why you see some, some people asking that uh, a president has a very long convoy. Then somebody asks you, what, what did you want him to have? Eh. So you mean if he, walked, if, if he moved with the two vehicles, he will die? But they put him high there. I remember the president once, once saying that bishops and other people should shut up because he's number two to God. You know somebody elevating himself that is assistant God in a country. <laughs> so that patronage is what has killed the system. Now people don't imagine, they cannot imagine that a patron like Museveni can fail in an election. They just think that instead, how do you deal with him to survive? So instead of people looking at the road network, just look at our road network. I was, I've been hearing this crap when people are giving statistics mm. that from Katuna to I don't know where, from Busia to, to I don't know where, the roads, are, the roads are very bad. Every time you go into a car, you just feel nobody speaks about that. Uh, nobody speaks about the health service, which is poor. This afternoon, we were just discussing the education system. Can you imagine that mm. we are going to have, there is a new curriculum, support ZLA new curriculum, where the first the first graduates of the new curriculum are going to sit their Uganda Certificate of Education this year, in November. But when they graduate, they will have to go back to the old curriculum because the one of the senior five and six has been stopped. It is not going on. Nobody is questioning that. They are just saying, oh, Mama, thank you so much for guiding this country. Did we Mama. Know it was stopped? It was stopped. If you didn't know, I was part of the process. They say they don't have money, and it was halted. And if I'm saying, Mama, thank you for guiding this country, guiding it where? Because you can imagine people are running a new curriculum, a new curriculum. It is going to reach November. It stops there. We go back to the old curriculum. What a waste. Nobody is asking. Today, uh, she was talking about the ingredients of a good elections. We had a lot of trouble when we were coming to 2021 election. People said we needed reforms. Mm, mm. And when they elected this uh, good friend of mine called Mao, we said, yeah, this is the one who was demanding for reforms. He's going to put them there. When he reached there, the man is just grimandering certain things which I don't understand. So we are going into elections <laughs> with the problems that we carried forward from 20... Why, why, why don't you call him? 
2021. Yeah, these days I told you that when I see him on the road, I may I may pass somewhere else. Uh, I was very by the I was one of the people who said I think this one, and he gave us hope. But the the, the hope is, was dead hope. So so I, I I just let me just finish this. We carried, we went to an election with a lot of problems. For example, our problem number one was the, the electoral commission. Has anything changed in the electoral commission? Nothing. The second thing was with the voter uh, tallying. Voter tallying. Has anything changed? The other thing was security of the people who candidates and the, and the contestants, especially the opposition. They looked like they did not have any security. They don't have the same, uh, uh, the same leveled ground like the president. Has anything changed? Nothing. The budget that is used by the president in an election is the same as the state house thing. We wanted something. Should the president contest when he's still in the presidency? Nothing has been sorted there. So, my brother, how, did you, how do you expect that the next election is going to be better? When, for example, President Museveni is looked at as a giver, not a person that we elected, to give us services. People are saying, oh, the president has ac accepted and given me this opportunity to serve. I see some of these miserable, so miserable ministers when they are thanking. The other day I was just talking to small kids playing football. And they were asking me, doctor, have you seen any country in Africa? You tell us any country in Africa. Where there is a president, the son is army commander, the daughter is a minister. The brother is the Operation Wealth Creation. Another brother is the, um, another a brother, a, a son-in-law is the one marketing Uganda in coffee taking. The the, the 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 daughter is the one who decorates Kampala. Where have you <laughs> seen <laughs> it? Where have you seen it? Thank you. Thank you. In charge of educating children. Where have you seen such a country? Th thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Please, uh, Honorable Cheno. You see, all these things we talk about are political problems. They are in the hands of you, the politicians. Why aren't you politicians leading us the right way? <laughs> now it's all our fault. Now I think actually, interestingly, yesterday morning, um, there was a power cut in my house and for about seven hours, I had no power and thankfully I had charged a power bank later, and thankfully I had deferred an interview with the Global Media Network. And I was asking myself, that normally wherever I go around, and particularly you young, beautiful ladies, particularly in your 30s, most of whom would normally be very lucky, we already got jobs and in positions, career done and things like that, possibly even many average families, particularly ladies, with a few guys. Ah, me, I'm not interested in politics, all those things. No, no, what my colleagues are talking about is the politics. No, you can't say that you don't, you're not interested in politics when it's about education for your children. You can't talk about saying that you're not interested in politics as if you don't check, check on your pay, paychecks. You can't say you don't talk about politics as if you don't have relatives who die. You can't tell me you're not interested in politics because you don't, you, you, you're superhuman, beautiful, because you don't fall sick. You can't tell me that you don't take in, in, in the road to Ntinda and then go via Chiwatule and go chuku 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 for one mile and another Nigeria chuku chuku for one mile. And the other day I went via Bulindo and I said, Bulindo, is this the posh end of New Northern Kampala and who's here? By then I'm even trying to check who the legislators. For the first time, I'm thinking of calling my friend the mayor and I'm also going to call the area MP. This is what I'm going to spare Mr. Museveno. How dare people tolerate this nonsense? That is the thing. So no, it's not about us politicians. And in any case, I've told you and I've told this program again and again and again. In this country, what Dr. Bojambi is saying, we do not have politicians. I am only one of the few. We have politi you know, people in politics, using politics, including Mr. Museveni. So I think Ugandans really need to wake up and simply say, no, enough is enough. To do what? To challenge these men, and particularly uh, with the fewer women in, in this thing, these days, men and women in politics, including those in the National Assembly who are eating our money. So we need to challenge these people a lot more. We need to challenge them. But look, I was thinking, as Dr. Jambo was talking about, talking and indeed Sarah, actually beyond Mandela, we need to go back to South Africa. After Mandela, Tambo Beki came in and became president. And the guy was actually thinking president. You know, uh, I gave a specific edition of my column for him, the New African uh, magazine, when I was still writing. You know, and with, and 
Mbeki challenged the global financial system yes. and said, this is leadership from Africa. Mbeki left, he was actually pushed out. You know what? Systems that work. Mm. You know, and that we discussed the other day. Yeah. Zuma came. The other day I watched a video in which Mbeki is giving a public lecture. I think people should actually Google that thing and do the rounds. Questioning Zuma and in these particular positions. The party is able to challenge this case. So that is South Africa. What is it that happened in South Africa? Which for us, we got it. I mean, yesterday was 11th of April, you know, uh, when uh, 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 Uganda was liberated off Idi Amin. Idi Amin was given to us directly, deliberately by imperialist forces, backed by a few Ugandans. Why? Because we're supporting anti apartheid campaigns, lest you forget. Because Obote is always blamed without the broader context. Obote one government was overthrown not because of 1967. Obote one government was overthrown not because he hadn't built hospitals, schools, and everything else. He was overthrown because Anglo America and the pushers of apartheid in Southern Africa wanted to get rid of him so that we were able to silence Africa. Why? Dr. Jambo, it's actually possible in this continent. In fact, you when know, Amin became president, he surprised his supporters and 100% started supporting anti apartheid forces. And, and by the way, it, and that, and Ugandans, that's what caused him trouble also. And in, 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 in fact, many, many Ugandans did very, very well. In fact, in fact, that was part of my reawakening. In Azala's primary school, we had an idea about this other thing. But then the next of the country is, is Namibia. Namibia, Sarah. Namibia has actually done most excellent, yeah. particularly in the Southern African region, starting with, with Sam Nuyoma and mm. the next and the next and the next. And then much more recently, the, the last president before, the late president before he died, you know, is now being served by an acting president. You know what? Uh, we told this program how a serving president comes in and explains himself, media, media, media information, giving people public information, things like that. But how they explain, you know, uh, the monies that, you know, their, their state house uh, uh, public entitlement monies, and how they explain how they're going to be able to, to spend money, whatever they go out, and how they're able to say that, well, this one, we're not going to use state coffers, state coffers go back. So it's actually possible in this continent. What happened actually generally, uh, Dr. Diamba, I'm reading a book uh, on, on, on neoliberalism, and, uh, and the title fades off me, and yet is in the car. It's a book that we need to read. How in Uganda, um, the Washington consensus came, took Mr. Museveni and a group of theirs, turned around the country, privatized it, personal owned it, and then sunk the minds of the people of our country. So basically, most of our people in this country are basically prisoners, economic prisoners. People are looking at their day-to-day -day -day living, so people are not critiquing politically. So meaning, therefore, even people in politics, and there are some in politics who generally mean well, who want to be practice politics, it's very, very difficult. So I'm simply saying, how, like Dr. Jambo saying, how do you walk Nigeria, how do you walk Bolindo and you're boasting in a big car and you come to town and you go back and you do it five times a week, maybe six times a week when you want to go to Christ the King or need to all saints. Then you go on TV and say and, the roads are very and good. They say are the you mad? And you think it's business as usual and you go to church on Sunday. How? So what? there is something fundamental wrong. This country. That's what I'm trying to say that no, this country is urgently, badly in need of a revolution. Unfortunately, I can put up my hands in a politician that I've failed, but of course, thankfully, I've not failed. It's simply say, truly so. Urgently, we need young Ugandans to begin asking and demanding of this question. Now, for me, I've said this, actually, at the risks of some of these other things, young Ugandans should begin to heckle. I saw the other day that uh, uh, Mr. Museveni was only told that, well, you're talking too much, and people were arrested. <laughs> Sorry, the lawyer needs to be able to advise on this one. That Mr. Museveni had a function for his uh, old friend, Mbabazi, that. Uh, some, some people uh, were arrested because they simply said, you're talking too much. Mm. So is this, that's in this Uganda. Ms. Honorable Chen, the one which was yeah. very interesting was recently at the Kavakaran. Mm -hmm. The dignitaries were seated, and there was a group of these young little guys singing a song. Ani Aliya, they would mention the name. Ani Aliya, they would mention the name. And I looked at the man they were mentioning. He almost ran away from that place. He was seated with the, the leader of opposition, opposite, I mean, next mm. like this. I saw him, he almost ran away. If young men can choose we, to and, do and, that and, and, and women, time. More of them, young men and more and of young women. women. But you guys, as we move towards these things, um, I want to say something quick. <laughs> but you know, I want to repeat, it is possible. I am young Melissa, just around your age, imagine, much earlier, I was victim of these Henry bandits, you know, from exile, in, from university, <laughs> you know. So I was lucky that my exile did not uh, keep me in uh, the concentration camps in northern Uganda, but took me to exile in the UK. You know, Sarah, election time comes. That's business as usual. 
And you see polling sites, and people can vote. You will not find a police officer. You will not find him. They think he's calm. You know, elections. And when the results have been pulled from there, these things are rolled over. They are packaged. And mostly normal local government officers, public servants, are normally the meaning returning officers. Nothing major with the edges of political parties. These things go to town hall, local government centers. This is a part of the Constitution to propose review things. You know? Things go to town halls, and you count the results. Everyone else is down there, and you clap, and the following morning, you go home. The best election of mine was the radical thing of the election of Tony Blair. By 10 o'clock, we knew we had got it, and people were excited in trains and things like that. You were for Nobody, Tony Blair? I, I, yeah, I, I, for, for, for the Labour Party, yes, of the Labour Party. And, um, and of course, yeah, I fundamentally disagreed with him on the war in Iraq. I was chairman of the, the Constitutional Labour Party at the time. And uh, that sort of ended our mini kind of relationship. And I want to stay here for. No, for Tony Blair is a, t is a great guy. I, uh, mm -hmm. But I voted against uh, the, the, the Labour mayor candidate, this is now Sophia, the Labour mayor candidate in favor of, uh, of, of, of Ken Livingstone, who went on to become a very popular lefty. And I thought Ken was being purged by the party. So this is talking about internal democracy. We need to be able to have the freedom and the right to be able to say that, look, this is the rules we're going to play. What I'm saying is, if these things can happen, part of what is talking about wasting money and, uh, and uh, breaching and abusing systems. If election ends, you know a political party has won, and the following morning, people continue as business as usual. So this thing that organizing a swearing in, huge amount of money, is a waste of public resources. What I'm saying is, Sarah, a future UPC administration in which I have got influence, or perhaps in which I lead, we are going to be able to change constitutions, including these other nonsense about swearing in of, of, of people. You know, you, you, Prime Minister goes to see the Queen, and you say, Prime Minister elect. Well, they come out, he's now Prime Minister that is handed with As business as usual, we waste a lot of money, we waste a lot of public resources, and actually, the more we do that, the more we create this impossibility of monsters in, in men, and most of them are men. And they're really normally powerless people because if they are powerful, they would not be having fleets of a village of soldiers uh, uh, surrounding Thank them you. when they should actually be having one or two people basically want to carry their bag and just a police officer just in case they fall off. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Birete, we keep talking about these bad leaders and the good leaders as well, but the challenge we get is 10 years, 20 years, 30 mm. years, we don't get them out of where they are. Mm. We have an example in Africa recently in Senegal the president tried to change yeah. things, the constitution and the law and passing of bills in parliament so as to continue his tenure. Senegal is refused. People power. And he's out of power. He's now in exile. Why can't we do this in Uganda? Well, in Uganda there are three dimensions. The first dimension is maybe a brutalized citizen. Since independence, we have never seen the peaceful land of power. The one that happened with the trio president of mm -hmm. Nyamchonchu and the rest, it was basically a ceremony, short period, organized elections, and so... They, they didn't even know what was no, taking place. No, nothing. So we have not seen... But it was peaceful. Yeah, the, the peaceful <laughs> short-term <laughs> ceremonial justice of Nyamchonchu, we recognize that it happened. Mm. So away from that, we have never seen a person who seeks power, gets power, exercises power, and then peacefully re relinquish. Mm -hmm. I think let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. We have never seen this person. Yeah. So it's like a curse on us as a country. I, I want to compare now this brutalized citizen, the, the moment really the apathy and the way mm. we can't even push back on roads, we can't push back on taxes, thanks to the Casita guys, they are trying. Mm. So, but the way everything goes, somebody appoints all his family into cabinet. The family, now as Dr. Jambo was talking about the family, people who occupy big positions, I was like, okay. So the, the cabinet, our cabinet is ceremonial. All of government yeah. decisions are taken in a family, in a family meeting. meeting. All you need is to say, can we gather for Sunday, and then Uganda is sorted. On that family ranch or whatever it is. Yeah, but Doctor, you're speaking Uganda. Yes. yes. And why is it that we cannot push back? We are like bees. You know, in, in, my, in my language or area where I come from, 
when bees are near the house, because bees bring something very beautiful, honey. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful, very fundamental in terms of our nutritious needs. If bees are near the house, you don't want them to go stinging, you know, children and everybody, and you don't want to vacate the house. So you get the millet that has been prepared overnight and put it in the beehive. And those bees will never sting anyone. <laughs> I don't know how other people do it. No. Yeah, so I'm, I'm giving you no free advice. Wow. So when you get a millet that has stayed overnight and put it in a bee, those bees will go on, produce honey, whatever. They will never disturb people. So you cannot say. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so you got around like this. He's from your neighborhood, isn't he? So he this. came to know, I think he gave you Ghana some rap. <laughs> yeah, in the one color. Yes, yeah, enjoying, enjoying, enjoying color. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So we are like bees. <laughs> Where uh, overnight color has been thrown. We can't push back on anything. A person appoints all his family. Gets power, you know. My, my father, may he rest in peace, participated in the bush. He was a part of the original members of UPM in Bushen district. So, once in a while, as children would see him drive this little local med shoes on his pickup to, to take supply to the well and other things that, 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 that transpired a few maneuvers, a few recruitments here and there, but he had his. Uh, Friends also in UPC were at his back because at one time or two he would get in trouble with that with that work as a collaborator. But Mze Tuberondo is at his back, so may they rest in peace. That that's uh, <laughs> so. See, we UPCs yeah. are fine guys, man. We <laughs> saved you guys, man. <laughs> that, that's another chapter. Yeah. So he always knew that the interim agreement was that whoever leads the first government. We lead on in the interim mm. and retire. And that was four years. So when Ndugu Ziritwaura opposed the first NRM extension, he was the only Ugandan that had not consumed this overnight millet. Millet. Mm. Yes. Mm. Very great wow. guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so he resigned we, his position. Yes. So that's what Ugandans should have mm. done. Mm. That's when the consensus. The Bush consensus on leadership, on transfer of power, was broken after the extension beyond four years. So four years led into then now the Constitution became the issue. Then in 1996, and then the interim says now I am new, everybody has to compete afresh. Mm. Then the, 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 the Ugandans that had consumed overnight merit thought, okay, we have time limits, so they fell for that. The, then we go for term limits, come to 005, the man again changes and says, I am now removing the term limits. And starting afresh. And then he started afresh, now countless. Then the bees, the, the, the overnight merit was still working. We come to 2017, then he says, now I'm removing yeah. also the age limit. The overnight merit is working. The only way that is supposed to offer peaceful transfer of power through elections should be at Kowan. Regular, free and fair, credible elections. The overnight millet is still working. We've never enjoyed <laughs> regular. We, we have only the element of regular. Credible, free and fair has never worked. So we are still feeding on the overnight millet. We can't push back. So now there is no safeguard. If President Seven is to leave power, when he's arrived, it must be negotiated. The only route that seems to be open is the natural one. Yeah, but sir, sir if you don't mind, uh, just, just a quick one. Mm. Because it's very important, the, some of the historical context, because I think you put me on the spot, but it's not about putting us Ugandans on the spot, about politics and politicians, and why not? Part of what Sarah was saying is also linked to the question of fear, linked to the Miller thing, but it's also this fear thing that I was trying to talk about people. These people saying, oh, me, I'm not interested because, oh, me, I don't want these guys to come to me. We need to break that. But yeah. as a matter of interest, yeah, Sarah, at what stage do you think, Mr. Museveni's colleagues, if people like your dad, and this is a very important point, by the way, if people like your dad could see this thing, you know, because I'm supposed to really hate your dad, you know, these guys who are for yeah. whatever kind of stuff, you know, but if these guys could come, but out of their convictions and supported UPM, out of their convictions, then they said, there is hope in Luero, you know, 
then people like you that are able to stand still and simply say, no, we mean this for the nation state. What about some of the other, many other colleagues, away from us, the rest of Ugandans? Why couldn't many of these colleagues continue to simply say, no, with Mr. Museveni? Because perhaps if there are five of your dads, maybe 10, people would have had a different outcome. But Honorable yeah. Chenno, there is a direct answer there. Mm. When you look at uh, President Museveni right now, he's a very lonely man. He, all his bushy comrades have oh, long I, left him. Have they have long left them. them. In fact, most of them may not have the, the agility and the power that they had during 1986. They would be in the bush. Most of them, the way when you look at anyway, them, yeah. when you look at them, the Kazoras, the, the, the ones who are alive at least, when you look at them, they are very dis disillusioned people. Only that they are now weak, they have Thank you. sick feet, and they cannot go to the bush. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor, and thank you so much. The Citizens Chat Show takes a very short break, and we shall be right back. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create, and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices, and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. You are still on Uganda's leading freedom platform, the Civic Space TV, and this is the Citizens Chat Show. I am Philip Melissa. Today, the conversation is about preparations for 2026 in this country and we are looking at the opportunities and challenges that stand in the way to a peaceful transition in this country and joining me on that conversation is Honorable Joseph Ocheno from the UPC, Dr. Birete Sara from the Center for Constitutional Governance and from Chambogo University, Dr. Ojambo Robert. Uh, where we left off, we discussed something very interesting overnight millet given to bees in <laughs> western Uganda. So <laughs> 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 well, very interesting it is, but also sad in the context of Uganda. Dr. Jambo, there has to be a time, a point in time, where Ugandans can vomit this overnight millet. Because if it stays, then we stay in the challenges we talk mm -hmm. about, the failed rule of law, the failed respect to human rights, the failed transition, and so on. What can induce the vomiting of this millet in this country? It's quite difficult, although for her she gave it from a millet analogy. I'd already explained it from a patronage uh, side. You know a patron, really makes uh, the clients or the clientele very weak. And when you look at the Ugandan society, they have really been made weak. Uh, for, that, for us who read, uh, by 19, in the early 60s, a dollar was less than a shilling in value. And the reason then was our coffee was one of the highest in, the, in terms of value. For example, countries like Vietnam, Brazil, and many others came to benchmark Uganda on how Uganda was succeeding in the production of coffee, organic coffee, Arabica and Robusta. And therefore, the people then were very strong. That's why you had associations of uh, traders, associations of farmers, uh, they, they were very strong 
the UPCs that you hear today had a lot of problems. You had to answer their issues if you wanted any vote from them. The farmers, they would come, gang up against you. Uh, even later in time, in Uganda, here in Ankore, in many places, uh, associations, cooperatives had a lot of power. And these cooperatives was, were of farmers and traders. Then number two, there was free education, and free education indeed. Uh, people studied for free, they went to the university, there was no strings attached. If a young man, when he got out as a, a graduate, he was this intellectual, he would do, go and speak whatever he wants. These days we go to schools with the strings attached. Either you are supported by the, the movement, and it's called what? State House Scholarship. In fact, even this scholarship that is given by the mm. country mm. is attached to the country Can the government yeah. somehow. The LOC must sign for you and declare that you're a poor guy from uh, my way to my village. So People are invited on government scholarship. Yeah, there is this thing which is called the, uh, the, 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 the student's scheme. loan. The student's loan. loan scheme. They okay. must sign for you. And therefore, yes. if, if they discover that you are not a good guy, they will not sign your form. So you have to go there and you see, so you go with you. I am a strong supporter of NRM. So there is that, that's how you build the clientelism. Uh, look at the uh, people who want to do business, have to go to state house to lobby, to be given some more money, to be given some little things, to be helped this. You can see traders, uh, uh, Sarah was, uh, was praising traders here, but they are making noise so that the president can hear them and call them for a meeting. Then they negotiate, then they say, the president has helped us. Professors at the university lecturers, they have to go to the state house to discuss their salary. Right now as we speak, professors who are sorted, as yet professors and vice chancellors. The other big lot is looking for an opportunity to meet the president. The president has been elusive to so, them. They are very willing to go in. So the president is Father Christmas. So the president <laughs> becomes the patron. And this patron, therefore, controls the survival of everybody. You want to go to hospital, you have a dangerous ailment, they have to connect you to the president so that he can write for you a pass and you go to South Africa. If you want to get any, so everything, you want to build a church, you want to do some witchcraft and you want to also succeed, you have seen this <laughs> and you also have to see the president. So the man is a client, he goes on elections and he tells people, that I am the owner of all the money in this country. He said this when he was in Gutambara by election. The money belongs to me and... Uh, Our taxpayer's uh, money. Yes, he says it is his money. And therefore, if you don't, he, he will close the... the I write top. these things, by the way, you can read about them if you Google my name. I write them, I'm not saying them here because I have this platform. I write them and put them on record. So this clientelism. It's very difficult to fight, but there is hope. Where is the hope? The hope is in the young men. And women. And women. Very soon, very few people, now Museveni cannot sustain his story on the bush war. Mm. Because the people is telling you the bush war, they say, what is that? They don't even they see any bush. What is that bushy thing? Why, why do they even go there? Mm. So now, <laughs> he has started deceiving them on programs like parish development model, uh, those in operation, wealth creation, Mioga, there is that thing called Mioga, I used to call it Miogo. Uh, <laughs> those things, the good news is that they can't work. They have been here, people have gotten the money, they are not improving, they are going to become disillusioned. And the patrons are normally killed by their own clients. Uh, we, are, we saw Mugabe in, in Zimbabwe, we saw Moi. Moi was not killed, but was pushed out. His real people, Nyayo, used to call him Nyayo. His really Nyayo members are the ones who pushed him away. Uh, it, it has happened in Burkina Faso, it happened in, in this country, Ivory Coast, now in many of these places. Only that the one of Museveni has delayed, because Museveni is like a, a rat. Seven behaves like a rat for those who grew up in the village like me. We used to have these stubborn rats who come and bite you. And they bite you. As you shake, they blow. 
so that you don't feel the pain. <laughs> so that you don't feel the pain. You, when something has just bitten you, it soothes you. And therefore you say, oh, that's very mm. good. You should continue. For example, people <laughs> took that Balaam statement. Uh, very, you know Balaam, there are, there are people who talk innocently. They are, they are not sophisticated politicians. They are, there has been a marketeer. So he comes and he gives a statement illicitly. He says, if you, you just give me the list, I'm going to talk to Muzei, and he releases you. A man releases, uh, arrests you or kidnaps you, mines you for three years. Then he releases you, and you thank him. You say, President, thank you so much yes. for releasing us and mm. releasing our children. Instead of telling and him, he wants to instead of now you. telling him, that, oh, so you are the one who had kidnapped our people. We have to prefer a case on you in the ICC or, or somewhere. They are saying, after all, it's better than Chagulani. For him, at least he has released these people. So that lulling, that soothing uh, behavior has been the... the when he starts a problem, then he becomes the, 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 solution, the solution to the problem. And the people start seeing him as a, as a, a, a savior. That's why the wife equated him to Jesus, the wife with her thinking. She, say, she thinks <laughs> that seven is the same as Jesus. Uh, he starts, yeah, but as a person in love, he starts a maybe war. She he has starts a, a war in, the, in northern Uganda. Do, do, those, doctor, if the wife was praising the man in their private affairs, it's because it's okay for a wife to feel like the husband is Jesus. But in their private things. We wouldn't even yeah. know, but this is a minister. So, uh, ORM7 is a very tricky, cunning human being. He starts a problem. The problem affects the people. And then he turns up to be the solution to the problem. And therefore, that somehow creates that, strengthens that clientelism. He becomes the, 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 the cause of the problem and the solution to the problem. For example, if you, you, you analyze his statements, he says, for example, that uh, he has come to fight what UPC created here. And one of the examples he gave was polio. They said, ah, how can he, how can he? But you see, he has given people Ugandans poor education. He has given the poor, Ugandans poor education, uh, which is never education, this UPE thing. And some people normally thank him. They think he's the first yeah, one who started. Yeah. UPE started in Tanzania in 1977. So he was not the first person. So this poor education, people believe that. But the good news is that when the roads become poor, the way they are becoming, mm. when the, there are no jobs, people are going to graduate more, there are no jobs, the PDM are not solving the problem, He's going to be eaten by his own clients very, very soon. Thank you. And when Thank those you, clients David. come, unfortunately, let me just finish this. Unfortunately, these clients need guidance. Because if they are not guided <laughs> properly, we shall go back to the vicious circle. Because mm. there is going mm. to be another cunning Museven. Because Museven is mm. not created in Africa alone or in Uganda alone. There is another Museven. Maybe son or what. <laughs> so we need some guidance. And that's why reforms, as she normally says, in the Constitution, we need to be very serious on them. We need to be very serious on cunning leaders. People who come, say this, but they do the other. We need to, be, to start training young people. For example, there is a bad thing that is coming up in our country. I normally go to primary schools and they are voting at the, at the prefect. Bribing has started there. Mm, so mm. parents who are there, can we shun these things? A leader, a young man, should come up in one morning, he says, I am a jumbo robot, I want to be HP because I want to keep this school clean. And teachers stop caning us. And that man is voted. Do you know how they created? They put a very long period of two weeks for somebody to become a, 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 a head boy of a school. I don't mm, want to mention any school. Mm, mm. That is bad. Just, mm. just wake up in the morning, say how many want to become HP? They put up their hand, mm. come and speak. Mm. How many say this one should be the mm, HP? Mm. So that we start getting good leaders and not, not camouflaged artificial leaders. Because the one who brings more sweets is the one who becomes the head boy. Sometimes he has nothing. You remember Cheno during our time. 
head boy was chosen on the assembly. That's correct. You yeah. come and say, well, you say this, you say this, the one who is okay. They say how many support or jumbo, they put up the hands, uh, uh, not countable. Another one has three, they say the head boy is this one. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. Thank you so much. Honorable Cheno, Dr. Jambo did, did talk about something very important, associations. And if you widen it, you talk about all the groups that bring people together. Religions, talk about, you mentioned Casita here, the traders. We have teachers, you have associations of lecturers, you have associations oh. of very many of them. How instrumental and impactful can these associations be in trying to achieve this that we try to achieve in this country? Ideally they should be, but the, all of them have been killed. And that's the lamentations from Sarah. In fact, Sarah gave that context. <laughs> and we've always had these conversations about how cooperatives have been killed. In any case, one of the things that I hope that we're able to regrow very urgently is the cooperative movement, number one. But number two, then, in the broader polity, Sarah, um, reclaiming the space for civil society, which is substantially being shrunk. But then three, most importantly, the trade union movements. And trade union movements will then link to the students' movements uh, that Dr. Jambo talks about. In fact, I am a net uh, beneficiary of the, 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 the students' movement um, because I became a class monitor on day one of, of my primary one in Nagongara Boys. Uh, in fact, the other weekend I was just attending the burial of my, my, former head, my, head, my former teacher's wife, the teacher who caused that. And all he did was, after the first assembly <laughs> and by, by the head teacher, all classes, retreat to theirs. We went to our classes. You get to your desk, you sit and everything. We had desks by then, P1, <laughs> boys and everything else. And then after that, the first business after that is going outside in the mango tree. And we're going and the, head, the teacher says, you are now going to choose uh, a class monitor. And of course, you know, and then they pe picked five boys. And in our case, we're sports school, picked five boys and we're not meant to speak. Simply say, oh, these ones, and they, do you want to be your, your class monitor? Maybe <laughs> your posture, maybe if you've done a good shot, things like that. And nearly the entire class went for me. Fast forward really to where we normally talk about these things. Um, by P6, I was the chairman of the debating club for the school, enabling students' engagement. A guy, I'm still answering your question, a guy who completed his PhD in the mid-90s uh, in America, surprised me, he's a Ugandan guy, surprised me. He was at, in my primary school, a part of his brother was my friend. And when I congratulated him, uh, he told me on a telephone call that, oh, Jamo Cheno, you know, you were the cause of this PhD. You know, um, he said that all of us in Nagongara Boys wanted to be like you or you or your friend. Now, these are impactful sense of organizational and institutional leadership. I was that because I was generally good people. But I was that because I also had student responsibility. But I was that because we were engaging. But I was that because so therefore students had access. But I was also that because people knew what to do in order to, become, to do the right thing and therefore in other words to become, merge and become the right leaders. Fast forward, the National Union of Students, uh, which people associated then predominantly with the UPC, majority were UPC, but it was UPC leaders because this is an ideological thing, meaning student movements and student organizations in, in, in institutions. It strategically helped students to debate, to engage, to contextualize, to play politics, and for leaders then to emerge. But then do you know what? The level of influence of National Union of Students leadership to national polity was like Dr. Dr. Jambo says, oh, uh, unparalleled. NUSU leaders impacted on government, impacted on public policy, just like Makero University and in fact, Chambogo, most of the national institutions of leaders, the student leadership in this country impacted on governance and they mattered. And political leaders took them seriously. So what are we saying? We need to re-engage and reactivate these organizations. But then two, which is the most urgent one, uh, trade unions. The trade union movement in this country is now a pocket for NRA, you know? You know, the where is this thing needs to actively, urgently be reactivated in terms of workers' rights, workers' welfare, workers' organizations, um, uh, uh, terms and conditions, um, and all those together. 
but also meaning, therefore, the more workers know that this is their power and power base, the more the leaders that emerge, trade union leaders that normally emerge, will tend to be the people who will not only speak their languages, but they relate to our rural folks in the communities. If you then do this and make sure the trade unions, uh, student union organizations, right now, like Makerere, in fact, I hope to raise this soon. I know there's an event coming up in Makerere University uh, about these things, about student leadership, where um, the, the, the guild leadership has now been confined to basically people, students are being bottled down. So the best with the money and the dubious yes, yes, then or the authorities vote online. Are, would vote online are the ones who succeed. And yet here we are nurturing not only national leaders for tomorrow, but we're actually nurturing genuine leaders for students, meaning students don't have the option, the choice, and the opportunity to choose the best of themselves. So translate that to the national thing, I repeat. The trade union movement, the cooperative movements in terms of communities, national union of youth organizations across the, the communities, whatever their names are called today, space for civic society organizations, you guys in the media, meaning therefore the your national union of journalists organizations that I'm told these days, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're cardinized, you know, these need to be done. Usually they're pro progressive leftist organizations, but usually they become alternative to academia, to academia and they become alternative think tanks. And together then with the national Honorable politics, Honorable General, you let see me the just give you the movement. example yeah, sure, of sure. now academia. When I just joined academia, we used to go to the main hall in mm. Jambogo there. Mm. Just go to the main hall. We say we are going to elect our leaders. And they say these are the leaders. And you appoint one, two, three, up to seven. Mm. You know, at that time, you are not allowed to think about what religion those people are. Yeah, yeah. What it, uh, ethnic group do they come from? These days we campaign for a month, and by the time the election time comes, people have thought people, about their ethnic and they've been torn apart. Yeah, their religion, themselves. which yeah. party they support. We find ourselves having chairpersons. Sometimes you may imagine that they are dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Dr. Yeah. Birete, the Electoral Commission is asking for to the tune of over a trillion shillings to organize the elections, but that's it. That is something to talk about later. As the process comes to this country, what are some of the opportunities? What are the benefits Ugandans are likely to get from this process, about, apart from the bad things we talk about? Well, the, the electoral roadmap for 2026 was budgeted at 1.3 trillion. I want to briefly talk about the money, because there are some really dubious expenditures hidden mm. in that thing. Mm. One is the 500 million for prayers. Justice be able to come up with this find the church, go and pray for mm -hmm. yourself, and God <laughs> help you do your constitutional duty. That is complete, dubious, complete, idle, Could estimate. that be tithe for the country? The churches ask for tithe. Let him pay. You see, Justice be able to come up. You, you, <coughs> Justice Biawakam is a, a judge of constitutional court, mm. meaning that he is charged with a duty to interpret the constitution and make all stakeholders understand the constitution. Let him read it for himself on the functions of the commission. You don't need prayers. If you need prayers, go with your commissioners and attend the church service. Stop praying around the, the minds of students. In the church of his choice. Mm -hmm. Citizens know where to go when they need to pray. This is really too much for if I, if I may put it that way. The, the second dubious item, and I don't know how many dubious items are there, therefore that this means that we need to open up that budget and kick out all of the dubious provisions they are hiding there. The second dubious item is the 18 billion for lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> That bill is exaggerated three times. Justice Biawakama, you need a maximum of six billion. Revise that bill. So I don't know how many dubious expenditures are there. They should all be deleted, starting with those two. Now going back to the use of elections. Ugandans, of course, coming from the knowledge of, you know, overnight minutes, Ugandans seem to be comfortable with changing Somali leaders. MP, if your MP is really a, 
you, you, there's a high overturn of MPs in each cycle of, of, of elections, about 70% and above. Hmm. So the MPs will change them. The LC5, LC3, councillors, those we can change them. So that's what is in there for citizens. But to me, that is about really 20% of what we need to get out of an electoral cycle. So we get out 20%. That is the turnover of those small leaders that I have mentioned. Mm -hmm. So when it why is the big post important? In our constitution, we have 46 articles that talk about the power of the president. Mm. 46. True. Wow. Not just one, not two. For, so that's why that office is very important. And that's why it should be left free for Ugandans to decide who occupies it. And that Ugandan should be servant of the people. Not like the one who told us on a labor day that I'm not your servant. Because a leader is a servant of the people that they lead. Even from biblical times, you serve the people. You attend to the sheep. When Jesus, we are still in the days of resurrection and the 40 days of Jesus to ascend to, to, to heaven, when Jesus was having his meal with Simon Peter and after preparing fish for, for the disciples, he asked Simon Peter three times, do you love me? Attend to my sheep. So that is also leadership in biblical terms. So I don't know what leadership that President Seven was referring to that does not make him a servant of the people. So, but then elections are very important because it's the only exercise through sovereign rights of the people are expressed by citizens. It's the only single exercise that makes you enjoy your citizenship by choosing who should lead you. It should be transparent, it should be fair, and Ugandans need to demand that this time round, Justice Biawakama and his team must produce a transparent national tele center. We do not have a transparent national tele center. I know there is also a tele center set up. Last time there were camps, tents in Chambogo, occupied by 80% military men. As if that was the qualification. Elections is not a war. No. Our soldiers keep in your barracks. Yeah, Bakama himself was stopped on the first day because he did not carry his COVID certificate. To, to access the tariff center? Yes. Can you imagine? Yeah, so who set up that tariff center? UPDF. There had to be communication. To really, there was a long discussion. Can you imagine? He didn't have a... So that's the extent of capture. Yeah. Wow. So the, the National Tariff Center at Chambogo was accessed by UPDF, police, prison officers, and main ambassadors. So the, 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 you had 80% servicemen and, uh, and then like 15% was Zungu. That's a national tele center. You can check the pictures. Check the pictures. So we need a national tele center for Ugandans where campaign agents mm -hmm. or polling officials of candidates are able to see results as they are transmitted in and tabulated and announced in a transparent manner. And ask Fairy questions. of that, reject these fake elections. Wow. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Jambo. One point three trillion shillings into a process you said is organized to reinforce the presidency of the incumbent. What do we get out of there? Yeah, last time Justice Biabakama. You know, every time he comes up with the. A, a, a number of activities which do not make sense. Last time he had a, he had a country-wide campaign um, uh, where he was uh, drumming up voters to come and vote. And I happened to have asked him a question. He came to Chambogo and I asked him a question that he, Justice Biavakama, in your understanding of things as a justice of uh, the Constitutional Court. 
do you think the problem in Uganda is the number of people who don't vote? Because just to watch from 1980 up to when you took up the, the, the chairmanship, is that the problem? And of course, for us, sometimes in uh, academics, we ask rhetoric questions, then we give an answer. I told him that the issue is not the numbers of people who don't vote. The issue is the number of people you declare. <laughs> you declare that have voted a certain candidate, and yet it is not true. And I gave him an example of the, the, the former elections where they, they declared a candidate and there was no celebration in the country. So I was asking, who voted this man? Mm. There was no celebration, at least in Kampala here. There was no celebration. There were soldiers moving around and making sure that... It, why did they think that people are going to riot after an election? It's because you are sinister. So I told him, just fix that. Announce the right candidate who has won. And you will not see any problem anywhere. Because these people will have seen in their in their polling stations who won in that place and therefore they total and find out that uh, this person. And that's why you don't have a lot of problems in LOC five elections. Because in most cases, those ones, they announce the one who has won. In most cases, LOC five. When it comes to MP, there is a contention somehow. In fact, in 2016, it was too bad to an extent that in Omoro County, they just announced that somebody had won. They did not even announce the total votes. I watched <laughs> that on TV myself. And they just said, this man has won. May his soul rest in peace. No tabulation. There was nothing. They did not say by this vote, by this vote. Therefore, this is the winner. They said, I am happy to announce to you that so and so has won. And the people asking, by what? What is the number? I said, ah, please don't disturb. <laughs> they whisked they wish the man out. In, uh, in Mukono, in Mukono, they announced uh, uh, an MP in Mukono North, where Chibule was. They announced Chibule also without, without uh, anything. This time around, that behavior was not so much. This time, 2021. Mm. 2021, they did not so much announce a number of people. I think they were sacrificed. But there was a contention on the presidency, on the presidency, the, as Sarah said. So uh, the money, 1.3 billion, uh, is a uh, trillion, is it to sort out which problem? Biabakama needs to be a little bit serious. By now, we should be sensitizing people because people are not sure whether we are going to have an election. Majority of the people have started saying, ah, and you know that is what creates voter apathy. So, so, so uh, that's what creates uh, voter apathy. So, 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 and the, the Human Rights Commission, because they are the ones who are given the duty to sensitize people about elections. We should be seeing them sensitizing people. Now they are going to put adverts for example, Yabakama has been accused of being partisan. Of being partisan. Now, the judge he is, in fact, he is not just a judge, a justice he is. Mm. Once people have doubt in you, why should you die there? Mm. Why should you die there? <coughs> so, has Yabakama ceased to be a justice? Because if he's a justice, once people have doubt in you, in fact, people are asking, is this man, this man was one time uh, 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 a legal Deputy officer Deputy DPP. Uh, 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 of the state, uh, judicial officer uh, of the state, mm -hmm. and was he somehow partisan. Why doesn't he leave the thing? So number one, uh, that money is not, first of all, going to be given to Biabakama 100%. That's what I gave you last time. That in Uganda, there is a difference between allocation and release, the final release. They are going to allocate it, but they will not release it as 1.3. That one I can assure you somebody can follow. Number two, when it is followed, uh, does Biabakama have control 
of the 1.3 as uh, the chairperson. No. That money is going to be controlled by different people at different stages. So about 70% uh, of that money is not going to go into election. It, was, it is going to go into other businesses. Uh, the, third, the last one, I really think that, uh, as Sarah said, we need sincere people. For somebody to be a referee, me, I used to play football when I was a young man. A referee is such a respectable man, and that's why they normally even put on a different type of attire. The attire is either black or one color one color in most cases, so that it does not confuse you. And they make sure that their uniform does not look like any other jerseys. Therefore, they are free. So until we fix that area, in Kenya they had tried to fix it, but uh, I think this man here, this is the former, the former Cheb chairman of Chebukati, Cheb 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 Chebukati Cheb just failed it. They had tried to fix it. The commission was elected with, from eminent people, professionals, and they had tried to fix it. But Chebukati was arm twisted, and now he looks a very funny person. Uh, somebody was asking, let's pick a small example from Senegal. <coughs> Remember, <coughs> the Senegalese president had refused that elections will not take place. In Senegal, they don't have an electoral commission. In Senegal, elections are handled by a equivalent of a local government something here, what we would call public service, public service here. And people were wondering, how are these guys going to control elections? But I was, uh, as I said last year, I think in Senegal, Islam has played a very big role, so much so that people believe in what they profess. You know, Islam is a way of life. So... These guys organized an election. A man came from prison one week, and he won an election. The day of his swearing, the president has now gone out, has run away, because he knew he was in trouble. So we want uh, an electoral process. We want an electoral process. But in Uganda, you would get a problem. Do you choose the bishops and the, the cardinals and what have you? themselves have a lot of problems because we have seen bishops. There are a lot of problems. There is corruption. They are all quiet. That's, bishops. That's they are quiet. Uh, do you choose policemen? And we used to think, in fact, the other thing I asked, I asked Segona. I said, Segona, you have been complaining that they have been getting, he used to call them men on the street to become uh, chairperson of the electoral commission. This time they are brought for you a justice, a justice of the constitutional God, are you now happy? He did not say anything. So, <laughs> so, so where are we going to get? How we can sort out this problem? How we can sort out this problem is to make elections not very elaborate the way I have said. This business of making elections very elaborate, that somebody must go and buy a suit and mm. campaign for three months, <laughs> then mm. walk. Who doesn't know these guys? Let them come up one week. They say elections are on yeah. Friday, being going to be handled by public service. So people will vote where you work or where you stay. Please wait there. These Thank things you. will be reduced. But you see, by making them very, very, very complicated, is to give people something to eat. And that's why there is 1.3. Billion. Trillion. Trillion. Now, I mean a trillion. Now Biabaka and this team are really salivating. When is this time reaching so mm -hmm. that we steal this <laughs> man and eat it? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Honorable Chen. Mm -hmm. This process is very complicated. It is very tense. But we must make sure Ugandans trust it and Ugandans are willing to participate. In the remaining one year, from the UPC perspective, how do we recover the hearts of Ugandans and make them come to the table and participate in this process? Amazingly, we are the, the best people to answer that question. And what has happened within the last few weeks? Meaning we in UPC? Uganda People's Congress. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I thought we <laughs> Okay, you can go <laughs> <laughs> but, but with you, in, in any case, um, I would be delighted to be having you all in part of my team <laughs> in, in future in Uganda Post Congress and so uh, are most of the, 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 the viewers. We are because um, in the last election, in the, the last by-elections in Dokolo, um, 
Interestingly, what um, uh, my colleagues are talking about, including the expenses, and I told you about how it happens in UK. You know, it, it's, it's not big events, and I, ex I, I was involved severally, number one. Number two, as chairman of the branch party and chairman of a constituency party, and also chairman of the vice chairman membership at a constituency level, we organize fundraising events for elections, including for our own lo local parliamentary candidates. You don't have to go and steal money from NSSF, steal money from, uh, uh, um, from, um, from hospitals, steal money from uh, people dying of malaria before you go to, into parliament or you get, get elected to positions. You do, because as local parties we do, we organize small events. Um, the biggest event I organized was uh, uh, a, a meal, a dinner, um, for which the, the guest of honor was Mrs. Blair and Sherry, you know. Um, plus one or two others, you organize the big guns come and then they talk and they give tropical kind of stuff, you know. And um, you, you make money and maybe you come with a few thousand pounds and that is sort of good enough fundraising, local fundraising. It does not have to be about the candidate. So you can just wake up. We need to be looking for good people, good ideas, good programs, good political parties that are going to give us programs. In my Nagongara where I came back last week, a child of a relative, I'll not go into details, a seven-year-old child died. This child died because they went to a local Nagongara dispensary and there was no blood. The child needed, uh, you know, uh, anyway, yeah? They called Tororo, there is no medicine. And turns out, the father told me, in respect, um, they got some blood in Bali somehow. Apparently, blood came, he had to pay for transportation, granted, not many other things. The child was given blood, but within sort of within a short while, the child. It was basically too late. This within the last yeah, one week. That is criminal. That is criminal. Now the worrying thing is that the majority of the people were the funeral. I could not attend the funeral uh, because I had other commitments. This end of town, you know. Possibly tomorrow I go to sing Nyongo Nyongo. No change. None of them mm -hmm. have actually seen anything to link very personally with them. But also Nagongara, we have this big Nagongara road campaign where we are basically begging Enery to repair road. Between, between Rubongi Barracks and Toro Town, it shakes worse than Bulindo. And there are even Enery ministers who passed there, and the councillors who make sought... make my place look very bad. Who sought, is our place, we shall sort it out. <laughs> who, who, who campaigned for public awareness, these guys were jailed, you know. And some of them, including Enery politicians, actively sang against them the public also need to mobilize and organize towards this. So I'm trying to talk about public awareness, and this is the extremes of this. But in Oya, I mean, in, in Dokolo, just taking us two weeks, that's a very important point, Sarah. Maybe it's something we need to consider. The short, is it a short days of time for campaign or not? The short time, people knew who the candidates were. People were very clear, the local population generally made up their minds. They want to return to UPC, and all of them should return to UPC anyway. Do you know what? It was short, swift, precise, and because of generally major public awareness, Sarah, people had resolved that they were going to return to their UPC, and they did. Please I have a do the literacy report. Indeed. And the viewers in it here. And, and, and you, 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 you call, you'll help me that with, in, in, okay. from the angle which you're saying it. But you know what? That did not only happen, you know, but I understand from certain people from the side of the state, they thought they might do something or they wanted to do something. And they sensed that the power of the people was such that this was an unstoppable thing. So it was not in their interest to try majorly anything in Dokolo. So the result was commiserate with the, with the aspirations, real aspirations of the people. Finally, therefore, linked. Where is the burden? The burden of responsibility then urgently lies with us, political parties and political party leaders. We need to urgently sort out ourselves internally. We need our leadership to come out, men and women, with legitimacy, with legitimacy, with credibility, with integrity, people with the mandate of our political organizations and parties, people with the intention that Uganda is ours, less about UPC, so that we work together, you know, to try and liberate the minds of the people as we prepare for these elections. If we were to do that, whichever way we do, Sarah is going to help me with one aspect of it. There is no reason why we actually don't do it, Sarah. Thank you so much. Doctor, as you address that also, 
from the civil society point of view, but also as a major electoral observer in the region and internationally, what chances do we have as a country to have a free, fair, credible election in 2026? <laughs> Let me start from the Rango Foundation. Rango as a region has reasonably higher literacy levels, and that helps in creation of an active citizenry. They are informed. It's easy to impart information on them. They will understand it. Really, it's very useful. They, they understand the impact mm. of their decisions in governance. So they, you will not take their 1,000 shillings to buy votes because that's not what it is. There is no cost for sovereign rights to vote. So that, that helps in improving mm. the, the electoral tailline in Lango. But also to add, I, I learned something from Honorable Jimmy Akena last night, and the, 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 the way UPC guarded their vote, yeah. a motorcycle per polling station. Fantastic. About 10 motorcycles following the ballot from the store to every destination to make sure there are no monkey tricks along the way. And the same happens after That's voting yes, yes. to the Italian to the counting. No monkey tricks. So they did not leave room for monkey tricks. And that helped the voice of the people yeah. to count. So what do we learn from there? The citizens are the very watchdogs we need yeah. for, their for their own democracy. It's the citizens that must make their decisions to count in an electoral process. And that's what everybody needs to do. So when it comes to comparisons with the other electoral processes, really, if I, I think Ugandans who are not exposed to what happens in other normal countries are very lucky. Because their chances of getting frustrated are really minimized. Well, yeah. well. <laughs> well, that is how much we are suffering here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, because you know, each time you step yeah. out of the borders of this country, yeah. you realize how abnormal things, are, things abnormal. are being done in this country. Yeah. Almost everything is abnormally done. And then you see people drumming up and chest stamping that we are making progress. Progress to a ditch? We are not building yeah. a nation in this no. country. We are not. Not in any process, not in budgeting. Not in taxation, not in corruption, grand corruption, not in electro cycle. So what progress do the leaders talk about? It's the biggest fallacy that has ever existed. But Ugandans who have no exposure, it is easy to be hoodwinked and to be on the streets celebrating nothing. We are just getting by. Like animals in the wild. It gets dark, it, it, it gets sunny the next morning. You are able to wake up, somehow you survive. That's how we are getting by as a country. There is no grand planning. There is nobody planning for you. Just look at the treasury. 4.05 trillion spent without parliamentary approval. This is above one million dollars. Mm. Spent. That is staggering of the highest order. But is anybody bothered? Is anybody alarmed? Nothing. In which country can you do such a thing? Do we see this country Congo. getting back? Yeah. It, it's a leadership issue. Yeah. It's a, there's nothing wrong with the people. Other than being docile and a bit laid back. There's nothing wrong with Ugandans. But there's everything wrong with the leadership in this country. Thank you so much. There's nothing wrong with Ugandans. There's something wrong with the leadership and you Ugandans need to do something about the leadership. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Birete, for that information and for joining us today. Thank you so much, Honorable Cheno, for joining us today and for the amazing thoughts. And thank you so, so much, Dr. Jambo Robert, for joining us and for your thoughts. And thank you so much, our viewers, for keeping it the Citizens Chat Show on Civic Space TV. Remember, this is made possible by the Center for Constitutional Governance. Thank you, thank you so much. Special thanks to the people behind the machines. The entire team will appreciate you and we say good evening and may you have freedom always.